What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. I appreciate you joining me today. Um, before I get to my interview, I wanted to take a couple minutes. Uh, last week, I mentioned that I would be addressing kind of the state of America and what's been going on in our country. And I wanted to take some time to really get into that. And we're going to call it opening thoughts. And I hope you, you take something from it and you can learn from it. Um, it's a time in this country that's very contentious and we need to be better. And I'm going to focus on that over the next few minutes. So stick with me. We'll get to my interview with Mike Bolsinger, a uh, former major league pitcher, in a few minutes. Um, but check this out. I think, I think we can all learn something from what's been going on lately. So these are my opening thoughts. I want to thank my friends and family for asking me to speak on this because I have a platform. Although small, I want to help make some change and for the positive. My big picture main point in talking about what's going on in this country is that we have to be better as people and as human beings. Over the last few weeks, we've experienced a lot. Nobody has all the right answers, but we all know things need to change. It's not enough just to post something one day on social media. It's not enough to say you're not racist. We need to be anti-racist. It can't continue. For those white people out there, including me, we have to start listening and be open to helping the black community. To make real change, we all have to be in this together and they need our help. What's been happening in this country for hundreds of years has just been accepted as part of the deal here. It can't happen anymore. Again, we have to be better. Whether it's a donation to one of these great causes, making yourself available, to those that are in need, or just simply reaching out to someone of a different background to listen and ask what you can do to help their cause. It might even be having a tough conversation with your own family and fixing the mindset on the inside at home, which is usually where it starts. And just like sports, it starts from the top down. The successful teams, the teams that struggle, it always starts from the top down. It's a time to be a leader and help the black community who is in need right now. In this case, it's our parents, maybe relatives, loved ones, friends that might need to be hit over the head with reality. It's a real thing. Some of our world has unfortunately had these ideals and built a culture of hate, which just doesn't make sense. Why so much hate for a group of people or any people for that matter? Ask yourself, are they really affecting my daily life that much for me to hate them that much? I don't get it. I never will. Sometimes it's hard to relate to somebody who has a different story than you, but this is a time when we need to relate more than ever. If you want to talk about it, please reach out to me or just take action however you feel is right to help the black community and show them, yes, their lives do matter. Let's actually make real change moving forward. Hopefully this will be a turning point in our history and let's make sure of that. Lastly on this, I'll leave you with, with a quote that I heard recently. And I want you to think about it. If you selfishly live your entire life just for you or your small circle, are you really living? I don't believe you are. It's so easy to get wrapped up in our lives and just focus on ourselves and not worry about others. We all need to take a step back and find ways to do more, whether it's donating, whether it's community service, volunteering, whatever it is. We have to. This, this country needs to change for the better. At minimum, call your friends who you haven't talked to in a while. Check in on people. Everybody's going through some shit. There's always something happening. So check in with those. It's important. There are greater causes out there and we need to be a part of it. As I said in the beginning, the big picture of this whole thing is we have to be better. So let's do that for the positive. Reach out to me if you have any questions on that or if you wanna discuss it. I don't know how you can argue against what's been happening lately. Um, we have to be better. It's as simple as that. So um, I'm open to discussion. Love the feedback. Um, you can email me if you would like at uh, two tall sports podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on social media, like I mentioned off the top, at two tall sports podcast. If you're on Twitter, it's at the number two tall sports pod. They only let you have a few letters on there. Um, or on YouTube, check out my YouTube channel. Just type in two tall sports podcast. Um, would love to hear from everybody. I mean, this is a real thing. You know, my show has mostly been about sports, not controversial. Um, but I, why have a platform and not use it for good? So that's what I'm doing. 
Um, would love to hear from you. But anyway, my next interview is with one of my uh, buddies and former teammates, Mike Bolsinger. He played in the major leagues for a few years, also pitched in Japan. So I think he has a really interesting story, and I think it's one that you'd like to hear. Um, so let's get to that. Without further ado, my interview with Mike Bolsinger. Enjoy. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Two Tall Sports Podcast. I got my buddy and former teammate, Mike Bolsinger, with me. He's uh, from Texas. He played his college ball uh, for a little while at Grayson Community College and then went to the University of Arkansas. And he's a former major leaguer and also played professionally in Japan. So welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for being on with me. It has been a long time. Yes, it has, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know it's been too long, but I'm glad we reconnect on here. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. Anytime. Yeah, man. Um, so let me uh, – oh, I want to at least tease something. Uh, later in the show, Mike is also um, famous right now for suing the Houston Astros, and he's going to let us talk about that a little bit later on. So stick around. We'll definitely talk about that. Um, because of all the scandals with the Astros and uh, the cheating that they were doing. So we'll get there, but we'll, bring, we'll go to the story first. Um, so you're, you're from Texas. You played high school ball there. Um, were you just baseball pretty much your whole life? Or where, uh, where did your baseball side of, of sports come in? I think so. I think, you know, my parents started me at such a, a young age. And, you know, I was playing other sports big in the hockey, basketball. I know I played basketball my freshman year in high school. It was all right. I didn't like the running too much. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was involved. But um, it was fun. And I actually, you know, one of the football coaches reached out to me and said, you know, hey, you have a really good arm. You want to come out and try quarterback? And before the season, I was doing really well. And I remember one of the seniors, and I was a sophomore at the time, probably 140 pounds. And this guy was – you know, he went, he went on the Texas Tech to be a running back. Uh, and he was our linebacker. And he smoked me. And I said, you know what? I think I'm going to hang up, <laughs> hang up the helmet on that one. <laughs> I hear you, man. But, uh, yeah, after that, it was just strictly, strictly baseball. You know, I didn't think I was going to get a scholarship uh, to play baseball at all. I thought I was just doing it for fun and then going to go on to, to college and, and do something with my life. And then my junior year, I ended up getting uh, – a letter from Louisiana State University it was my first letter I ever got. And that's when I was kind of like, okay, you know, maybe I got something here. Okay. And so one highlight of your high school career, at least, so you obviously did really well. You, you got to play against Clayton Kershaw in the state semifinals. Is that right? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I, you know, whenever we were together, when it had been such a long time since that game, uh, when, I, when I met up with him, especially in the, in the big leagues, you know, he always liked to bring that up. You know, he hit a rocket double off the wall off me. Uh, that's something that he liked to bring up. But, yeah, you know, I've known him. I actually played um, travel ball with him. It was called uh, Dallas D-Bat. I don't know if you ever – I know there's a couple in California that have their little hitting cage facility. Um, we were probably one of the first teams um, that they assembled back 2000, 2001. So I've known him for a while, um, and you know, most recently, while playing pro ball for the past ten years, he's been the guy that I've been playing catch with uh, in the off season. Him and a couple other guys. So it's been a lot of fun to to play catch with him and to get into his mindset because it's such a it's different. There's when you think of some of these people who play sports, they just have that that it, and and he's. He's one of the guys that got it. He's focused and disciplined, man. He doesn't mess around. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of funny. You got to play for the D-backs when you're younger, and then you played against Kershaw, and you end up being playing for the D-backs and a teammate at Kershaw. So it all, yeah. all came full circle for you. <laughs> um, so out of high school, though, you originally chose to go to Grayson Community College, right? You didn't go to a big four-year. So um, what was that process like, even though you had offers? Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, I remember we were playing a state tournament. My dad ended up calling or telling me after the game he's like hey you got drafted and um, I basically without telling him said no because my dad thought it was more important to go to school or maybe kind of get another year and experience at a higher level and that was the last year that they could actually do draft and follows if you remember that whole time. yeah 
Yeah. I think the Indians were the ones that drafted me and did the whole draft and follow. I ended up getting hurt. And I only wanted to spend one year at Grayson where I was. And I ended up going on a visit to Arkansas and I saw David Price pitch on a Friday night against uh, the Razorbacks and he was at Vanderbilt. And I was like, I, I want to go here. Like the atmosphere was incredible. Uh, you know, to me, it's hands down the best baseball in the country at University of Arkansas. SEC, yeah, there's a lot of good competition down there, definitely. Um, what? So, yeah, you finally took a visit there, and it, uh, you had the opportunity to go to the College World Series there. Yes, we went my junior year, um, got beat out by LSU. Uh, that year they had – I mean, they were an incredible team. I know they had Matuk. Um, they had a guy who played Mitchell. I think he was with the White Sox center fielder. I mean, yeah. they had a football player on that team too who threw like 97. It was just incredibly athletic team. Um, what was so, it like in Omaha when you like that experience? Because a lot of people don't like college baseball. That's the goal to get to Omaha. What was that experience like playing there? It was awesome, and to not only play there but to play at Rosenblatt. You know, I think that was the second to last year. So the next year was actually the last year of the College World Series. And that next year also, we actually lost in the Super Regionals against ASU. So I really wanted to go back, but it uh, didn't work out that way. But, man, it's, that's a totally different world. And I ended up actually, side story, I was sitting there shagging balls in the outfield, and Mason Griffin popped up, one of my teammates from junior college. And I was just like, man, I haven't seen you in, like, 12 years. And it's just crazy because he was coaching a, a summer ball team, and it's like all these – you see so many young kids and all this. I mean, the atmosphere is, is awesome. It's, it's hard. It really is hard to explain. I'm sure it's a dead town. I've been there playing minor league ball, and it's just ghost town when there's nothing going on. But for that one week, week and a half, it's an incredible experience. Oh, yeah, I bet. Um, so after you, you played at Arkansas, and then you got drafted again after that year, but you chose to go back to school, right? Yeah, I ended up – getting offered something that just, you know, to me, it wasn't worth it. I think it was, I was first off, I was so close to graduating from school. I saw the more importance in that. And plus I was in such a good school. Um, to me, I thought if I performed, I would get another chance at doing so. You know, Dave Van Horn was so good with the scouts and how he recruited and getting people to come out and watch you. It was just kind of a win-win situation, especially just to be able to go back and play baseball at the University of Arkansas for one last time. I mean, it's a lot of fun going to school there, right? <laughs> oh, man. I had, a, I had a blast. I missed it every day. I think, I, you know, and I haven't been out there in a while. I think the last time I was out there was for a buddy's wedding. But, you know, my wife went to Old Miss, and that's usually where we go every year to go to the – I think they call it the Grove. Okay. Remember. But we usually go there with all her friends and, and watch football. So it's been a while since I've been back to Fayetteville. Yeah. Um, so after your junior year, you got drafted, you chose to go back. And then after your senior year, you had a good year and you chose to go, you got drafted in the 15th round by the Diamondbacks back in 2010. So then you feel like at that point, all right, I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to play pro ball. Yeah. Until I got there, I got to Yakima, Washington. Let me tell you what. I was going to ask you about Yakima. <laughs> I, I think the year after I, I left, or the next year, they actually closed down that stadium. No bang on Yakima, Washington. I mean, it was crazy. I don't remember what rain looked like for four months because you're in a valley where the rain would just – you think it's going to get a – you know, praying for that rain out, and it just kind of goes around the, uh, the valley. So, But, yeah, I remember calling my dad two weeks in. I was like, Dad, this is uh, – this ain't for me. I'm, I'm used to, like, showing up to the field, getting free gear from college – and stuff like that and getting treated well. And then I get to Yakima, Washington, where at the time we didn't even have an air conditioning. I remember we won like 20 games. We won like 15 out of 20 games. And our uh, head of scouting came by and he's like, guys, I bought you guys a portable AC. Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> and that was the greatest thing that we ever saw. That and we usually ate watermelon after the game. So, man, it's – if we could get a bunch of minor league guys together and just tell stories, people don't realize it's, it's so funny. Um, 
the things you go through and the experiences. You hate it at the time, but I look back, I'm like, man, what a great time that was. Right? I mean, everybody's, you know, in the same boat. We're all playing, you know, nobody's got a job. We're all playing baseball for a living, like in your weird small towns. Like that's why I had, that's why I'm doing this to kind of shed some light on that, on that lifestyle. Um, so you played in Yakima for a little bit and then you played in South Bend, Indiana, which is probably a little bit of a step up next to Notre Dame. But what was that experience like? That was fun as well. I had a great coach at the time. Um, Mark Haley, he's yeah. a awesome guy. So, um, <laughs> side story on that. I remember we had a, we had like this young kid who signed for, I don't know, probably a million dollars. And I was just talking to him. I was like, man, I miss the old days when you could sit in the back of the locker and sit in the dugout and smoke a cigarette. And, <laughs> and he's like, you know what? I bet you $100 you don't do it. So I went up to him and I said, hey, man, this guy's going to pay me $100 to smoke a cigarette at the end of the dugout. Do you mind? I mean, I'll give you like $20. He's like, hey, light one up. <laughs> oh, damn. That's awesome. Uh, so I think it was the next inning. I got one of my teammates cigarettes and just sat in the back of the dugout. And I was like, man, I should have been playing baseball in the 1950s because this is my element right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. See, these are the cool stories nobody gets to hear about, right? Yeah. Um, so you, you play in South Bend, and then you move on to Visalia, California, which is high A for the Diamondbacks. Um, as for people that don't know, pitching in that league, um, I know you weren't susceptible to a lot of home runs, but there's a big wind factor. It's a hitter's league. What can you tell us about that league? Yeah, it's interesting. And it's a, it's a very kind of, you're on the countryside of California. So, you know, I, I hadn't been to California too many times, but to get there, I was like, oh man, beaches. Next thing I know, I'm looking, there's a cow pasture. <laughs> I got the great cow smells coming in, but yeah, you know, it's tough, especially in Visalia. You know, there's some of those ballparks that are so old and and they haven't been. And it's just for all the ballparks everywhere. But it makes them – that's what makes them great uh, uh, to talk about. But there, that field, um, you know, I remember talking with Tyler Skaggs about it because uh, he had an awesome curveball as well. But he's like, man, in the first three innings, all you do is you throw a curveball because the sun would hit the back stop so right that a hitter really couldn't see it. So for those first three innings, at least eight strikeouts you're going to get. But the wind blows out there. My point was that at like 30 miles an hour sometimes, right? And oh, yeah. I mean, I think Paul Goldschmidt put that field to shame when he was there. Um, you know, they used to pass the hat around for him. And I think they ended up having to stop because – I mean, the guy would hit two home runs a game at least. And it's – and that's not even the worst field. I mean, I can't remember the worst field. I think it was Lehigh Valley or something like that. Or maybe Lancaster. Lancaster, yes. I um, I was supposed to pitch the next day and I ended up getting called up to double A. And a couple of my teammates who were pitching really well, I mean, you saw them go from twos to fives. And I was like, well, guys, see ya. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah. So, yeah, you get, you get called up to Double A, and that's where you and I meet in Mobile, Alabama, of course, the famous uh, home of the Double A for the Diamondbacks at the time. Um, when you got to Double A, how did you feel about that league versus high A? Did you see a difference there in the hitters? As a I think so. Um, you know, it's funny. I compared Double A to your best hitters and pitchers that I saw in college. Because I thought in the SEC, you're playing at such a high level. Not only that, but in some of those colleges that you play with or play against, you're playing at such a high level. That's where it kind of got to be at that level. But you saw a lot more discipline at the plate. Pitching was kind of the same. You know, you, Of course, you're going to get those guys who are throwing 100 miles an hour. Don't know where it's going. That's just the name of the game. But you could see the difference big time in the hitters um, from A ball to double A. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as far, what do you uh, do? You have any memories from from Mobile or any? You know, that was a pretty fun team, if I remember. You and I used to just, you know, do impressions of people all the time and do fun, <laughs> do funny accents and do all kinds of stuff. It was fun. It was just, you know, it was we were all getting close, but still, it was still fun. 
I mean, that was by far the best team I think I was ever part of. Um, man, we had that. We we walked out to WWF music all the oh, time. Oh, yeah, that's right. We we picked <laughs> <laughs> we all picked WWE entrance songs and, and walked out to our – when we went got called in. That was awesome. Uh, of course, Wade, uh, the clubby guy, was just – amazing who i I, you know i i talked to his dad his dad will text me out every now and then i'll ask how everything's going um you know with him um turner ward our manager at the time i mean he that was one of the best coaching steps i think i've ever been a part of as well they were all just class act guys and like i said the team was awesome um you had to make the best of mobile alabama Um, right but it's fun. You know, I never really went out too much until I think a couple of us did. And, you know, it, it, the nightlife was fun. I mean, there's stuff to do. You just had to kind of go out there and explore it. Um, yes. So I enjoyed it. That was probably one of my greatest years I've had and, and, and memory wise and having fun and actually, you know, cause baseball's, you know, it's not so much fun all the time. You have to do something to make it fun. And I think that team kind of like rejuvenated the, the fun of baseball in me. For sure. I totally agree with that. So you got to, once you, you played in double A and then the following year you got to go up to triple A. So now you're really, you like, did you feel like at that point you're definitely close to making it to the big leagues? Yeah. You know, even when I was in double A, because I talked to my old teammate from college, Drew Smiley, you know, when I got called up to, to double A, I told him, he's like, man, you're right there. Cause he had actually gotten called from double A. So keep, just keep pitching keep doing your thing. But yeah, once you get to that triple A level, you're, you kind of just feel like, man, like I'm here, I'm this close, you know, especially if you go up to that PCL um, league, especially in Reno and you go out there and you do well, people are going to take notice of it and, and give you that shot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just kind of like the Cal league. It's, you know, it's uh, thin air and, you know, the ball flies in a lot of those ballparks, especially in Reno. It's a great ballpark, but um, oh, yeah. I, I thought Reno was a lot of fun because they got the casinos right there. They is oh, it's pretty. Yeah, I spent a lot, a lot of nights there. <laughs> the the best time. Yeah, again, like I went with Skags to yeah. uh, rodeos. We go to oh, rodeos. Yeah. Off days, and uh, you want to go to rodeo, Mike? I still got the hat he bought me upstairs in my room. <laughs> um, but man, those are great. also great times. Like I can. Honestly, say that D back organization as a whole. I mean, that was so much fun to me. Yeah. Um, I think all in all, they had a, a great staff uh, that they were running over there. So I really appreciated the way that they kind of handled everything. Definitely. And you pitched really well there. Um, and when, let's see, on what was it? Uh, April 14th, 2014. Do you remember that day? <laughs> I think it's the day you got called up. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it's you know I still have the video in my phone. Um, at the time, it was Phil Nevin was my manager, and um, I guess he had got a lot of the older guys together, and they were all like, "Hey, you know, why don't you come out and, and uh, come eat with us?" And I think uh, Wolf was there. Is it Randy Wolf? He was there too, and. I think in everyone's mind, he would be the first guy to get called up because he's a big leaguer. Um, but they took me to this restaurant, and uh, Phil Nevin actually calls up the phone, and he's going on and on about stuff. And he's like, why don't you make the big leaguer pay? And I'm like, well, he's right here. Make him pay. Tell him he can pay for everything. He's like, no, no, you can pay. And I'm like trying to figure out what he's trying to say to me. And he finally tells me. It just like hits me, and I can't talk or anything. <laughs> and, oh, man, it was – Amazing. It was an amazing feeling. Call my parents. Um, you know, they were awesome. That was the first call. I called my parents and I called my two buddies from college, my roommates. And those were the first two people that I called. It was a great experience. You know, that's something you don't forget. And it was a lot of fun. So. Oh, for sure. Definitely. And so you get called up and I think they throw you in the fire right away, right? You pitch the same day or the next day? The next day, yeah. I pitched, pitched against the Mets. I ended up striking out the first hitter I pitched against and I think I came out of the bullpen after Coleman or um yeah I think I gave it one run in three innings it went well and then I had my first start against the Dodgers and I remember the first four innings of that game I was like this 
I can do this. I, I can do this. This is not that hard right now. Boy, was I wrong. The next yeah. inning, four <laughs> innings, no runs. It turns into four innings, four runs. I can't get out of the fourth inning. But, man, it was a great experience. Um, you know, pitching at that point, I was, like, pitching at Dodger Stadium. The only thing that can get better than this to me is pitching at Wrigley Field. And lo and behold, that was my next game that I pitched. And I got my first big league win against the Chicago Cubs with my family. Because my family couldn't make it out to um, L.A. First game I pitched in yeah. Arizona. And they couldn't make it. I think they made it out to L.A. I can't even remember if they did or not. It's so far back. But I, they were there in, at Wrigley Field. And I thought that was one of the most special moments to have them all there and meet me under the tunnel after the game and actually get my first win. Uh, you know, it's, you, it's like stuff you can't you, – you write movies like that. that kind totally, of man. You get to go to Dodger Stadium and then you go to Wrigley. Like, damn, what was it like pitching at Wrigley? Oh, it was – I can't even describe it. I remember when I first got there because I hadn't been there in so long since I was like a baby. I didn't even remember it. So I just sat in the stands literally for an hour and I just kind of looked around, watched him do BP. And I was even, before I went in the pitch, like, I just stood out by the field for like an hour. And I was like, man, I got to go change and get ready. Like, I was almost late to go out and warm up. <laughs> kind of soak in everything. I mean, you're at Wrigley Field, Chicago. Like, this is what my team that I've grown up, loved, and rooted for my whole life. And now I get to pitch against them. It was just it was amazing. Amazing. That's awesome, man. Well, hey, congrats on getting up there. And that's a huge deal. So, that's, that's awesome. Um, unfortunately, winter of 2014, you get designated for assignment, but you get traded to none other than the Dodgers, where you get to re reunite with Clayton Kershaw. So what was it like now playing for the Dodgers? A different experience. Um, baseball is totally different in LA. You just, I mean, obviously you're going from, here's every other team besides maybe the Yankees or the Red right. Sox. Right, right. And then you got those three teams up there. It's it's Hollywood, and it is Hollywood. But it was like you go to the stadium, and you know I show up in spring train. I got Sandy Koufax standing by right beside me, um, Newcomb standing there. Um, you know, as a guy, I talked to him in the stands. You know, before he passed, um, you know, he would tell me all about everything. And I remember I didn't even have a place to live at the time, and his wife would talk to me about, hey, if you ever need a place to stay. Let us know. Well, yeah. And I was like, man. That's cool. But they were just the nicest people in that whole organization. To me, too, was just top notch. And obviously, to be playing at Dodger Stadium is, is crazy. And I think my favorite story there was it was the day that I had a pitch. I got into the elevator, and then it was about to close. And then Ben Scully walks in, and the late, the person running the elevator was like hey do you mind if we take him up first uh you know i was like yeah sure like i'm i mean whatever yeah like, whoa 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 ma'am i don't know if you know who that is that's mike bolster he's starting tonight you can take him down first and i was like whoa fist pumped him walked out had a great game i remember giving him a shout out in the media or the media after the game but i mean that's crazy it's like top notch there from him to Freeman, GM, awesome guy, which a guy I still talk to today. Oral Hirsch, is our guy I still talk to. I mean, all these people are top-notch people. Um, shoot, it's where I got into wine. I've never seen people drink more wine in my life. And that's where I fell in love and, and started drinking wine and learning about it too as well. So thank you for them for that. There you go, man. <laughs> One of the weird rivalries, I don't know if you were a part of it a lot, but the D-backs and the Dodgers had like a weird yeah, rivalry. Yeah, interesting. What what was like? What was that? Was it mostly because of Puig? Like, what was it all about? I'm trying to think when it all really started. I think it was when Granky and the whole Kennedy thing kind of happened. When he, I think Kennedy hit Granky in the head actually in a retaliation oh. or something. So that's where it kind of happened, and it trickled down to the minor leagues because we had some brawls in the minor leagues especially when I was with Reno I is a game I was actually pitching I forgot who it was he pimped a home run and basically walked um around the plate and at that point 
you know, I was pitching the next day and I'll leave it at that. I wasn't told by anyone, to do <laughs> but the next day I, you know, first pitch when he got in there, that was all that was in my mind was no way you're, you're not going to get a hit. I'm not going to let you. And I freaking missed my first <laughs> pitch. I think it might actually hit his bat and fouled off. But at that point, my coach told me to come out. I was like, hey, we can't have you hitting anyone because our bullpen's depleted. We need you to go at least the whole game if you can. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, all right, Kevin. So at that point, I, I think I am striking him out, and he didn't like the call. And him and the catcher got into it, and it was just a, ma- a street fight. Best, one of the best brawls that I've probably seen between, you know, I think who was on that? Mike Jacobs was on that team. Um, yeah, he doesn't mess around. No, he was throwing punches. Yeah, it's weird. That whole thing was – yeah, go ahead. You chafing too. I mean, oh, yeah. He was a crazy guy too as well. But, yeah, it was – um, and they still have their, their problems going on. It's so weird. I don't know if it's because they're I'm so close, obviously, but it's, it's fun though. You can, you can feel it every time they fly for sure. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so after you are, you leave, you get traded from the Dodgers to Toronto. So now you're on your third major league team. I mean, everybody hears good stuff about Toronto, you know, from the city to the nightlife and everything. What was it like for you playing in Toronto? Again, it was a great city. I, uh, I definitely fell in love with that city. Uh, I'm a big clean guy. Like to me, like, where I know I can walk outside and, and like walk around the city in my bare feet. That's how clean it was. Like, it was amazing. Um, yeah. Just like the food the you know, the, the bar life, just going out having a drink and just relaxing the rooftop bars, the scenery, everything you get to see at night. Um, playing at the stadium is, is awesome as well. Especially when they open up the stadium, you get to see the, the needle out there. Um, it's great. Now that's why I had the opportunity to go to Montreal and play at Olympic Stadium, which that's no joke. I mean, that's Montreal's crazy. I mean, that's just hands down. If you ever have a chance to go there, you should you should go there. It's great. Again, great food. Um, I'm a big guy who likes to eat food and drink beers, and they like to do all that out there. So. Uh, <laughs> all right. That's cool. Um, so I'll tell you what, we'll come right back. Uh, we'll take a quick break once again at two tall sports podcast with my buddy, Mike Bolsinger, and we'll come back and talk about his experience in Japan right after this. Welcome back at the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Once again, my buddy Mike Bolsinger, former Major League pitcher. And I want to continue talking about his career. Uh, so you were in Toronto, and then you kind of bounced around, went up and down, and then uh, you became a free agent in the offseason. And then you had an opportunity to come up to play in Japan professionally. Was that ever a thought for you that that could be something that you could do? You know, no, it, it really didn't process in my mind at all. I just thought, hey, you know. Next year, I'm just going to try and go to a different team and, and, and make it work. Um, you know, I knew I was getting a little bit older for the likings of the scouts out here in the United States. So um, it was going to be tough. But, you know, I ended up getting lucky and, and, and talking to the Chibalote Marines. And um, I liked, you know, everything that I was hearing and, and the people I was working with, the guy out here. Um, the scout that I talked to, he's, he's been awesome. Um, to this day, he's been awesome. Uh, so it, it ended up being an easy decision, not for me to play baseball. Now for family wise, a wife that's pregnant. Yeah. There's a little bit we had to talk about on that point, but, um, to continue my baseball career and potentially get back to the major leagues, I think this was the route that I was going to have to take. Um, you know, that last impression of me kind of in the big leagues with Toronto was not too good, if I can remember correctly. We'll get, we'll definitely get there. <laughs> <laughs> that has to do. 
that has to deal with the Astros, but we'll, it all comes back to, uh, at the end full circle for that scandal. Um, but you get the opportunity to go play in Japan. And then, um, like you were saying, you had to have uh, your kid out there. Yeah, it was, um, you know, the doctors obviously are awesome out there, but you know, you're in a, a different country for the first time having your first kid, um, you know, language barrier is real. It's, it's, it's real out there. And, um, you know, it's not like if my wife goes into labor in the middle of the night, I can just get into my car and go to the hospital. That's not how it works. Cause you don't even really go to a hospital. You go to like a woman's clinic and technically they're not even open at that time. So it's just every, I don't remember sleeping for probably two months and somehow I pitched well that season. <laughs> I don't know how I did but, uh, it. It's stressful. Um, you know, and she was stressed too. And it was, it was sad to kind of have to put her through that. But, you know, for me to continue to play baseball and to provide for my family, that was the kind of route that we had to take. And it was a huge sacrifice again. Um, you know, not a lot of people know my wife was pregnant before and we actually lost the baby really late. It was probably about eight months. It was a stillbirth. Oh, wow. so, you know, not a lot of people know about that. There's a few guys in the Toronto Blue Jays that knew about that at the time. So she, at this point, she's already even more cautious. Um, so it was, it was tough. It was a tough decision. But she got on board with it and, and, it, and it went as smooth as it could go. Um, it was tough to watch her go through the pain because she didn't get a epidural or anything. They really didn't have them. Oh, man. Think, so she had to do it naturally. I think quote unquote, what the doctor told her was <laughs> just fight, fight <laughs> in my life, whatever she, her eyes were saying, there was, I could, I could, I could say it for you probably would have a lot of bleeps on the radio, but you man, can do whatever you want on this show. <laughs> there you go. But when she, when he said that, I even got pissed off at that point. I was like, fight. I mean, just give her a shot. She just can't feel this because it was, because it's, I don't know how long it was. It was over 24 hour labor because it was induced and she had to actually have the med stop to induce her because it was hurting so bad. And uh, it was tough. And the way they do it out there, you know, I couldn't even like see the baby come out. I had to be on the other side of the, you know, by her head and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it, was, it was tough, but it all worked out really well. And we were surrounded by, awesome people that helped out so it made it just that much easier Jeez, that's i'm glad you got through that man that's crazy it was a, it was crazy it was a tough time but you know i think that kid has an awesome story to tell when he gets older definitely for sure um as far as you playing out there so not a lot of americans get to play over there so what is like the regimen like the day-to-day -day, how the team works how like what is so what is different about playing in japan than playing in the united states so, you know, I couldn't even tell you because the way that our team was run was so Americanized. Um, we had our manager was, Iguchi was actually a player for the White Sox when they won the World Series. I think it was 2005. Yeah. So he kind of knew the American way of doing spring training and, and what you need to do and how much time you really needed off. So I'm hearing these horror stories from some of the other guys like, oh, we've been out here. We got out here at 7 o'clock and we haven't left at 6 o'clock at night. I'm like, dude, I got here at 9. I just left at 11.15. I'm done for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I love that schedule. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was so lucky with that, um, you know, from obviously that coach. I've just been really lucky with the teams I've been on. I've been with good people and the GM out there and the coaching staff from the scouts to my translator I had, they were all just first class, first class people. I love that team. Even, you know, the most important person to me was the pitching coach at the time. My first year, the pitching coach I had, both of them actually, the bullpen coach and our bench coach. I mean, they helped me out so much. You know, not only is it a different place, you know, a different country, baseball's totally different then you have a totally different language barrier i mean your coaches don't speak english they've played in the states before but you know it was tough and he made it so easy for me to 
to pitch out there and the information that he gave me back and forth that first year, it was amazing. And I give all my credit to not only the, the, guy, the big league coaches up there, but so whenever you um, aren't pitching as a starter, you don't have to travel with the team. So you go to the minor leagues and you work out with them. And that's where even more relationships were built. The coaching staff at our minor league facility was hands down the best coaching staff ever. So they just made it so easy for me to go out there, get my work done, do my business and be done and, and pitch well. It was just, I couldn't have asked for a better environment. That's cool. You know, That's baseball cool. standing in that kind of situation. So I was highly lucky because, like I said, I've heard lots of horror stories about how some of us, that traditional baseball in Japan, it's totally different. Right. Some Americans might not get it. You kind of – that's why you don't see a lot of Americans kind of survive out there because they can't get on board with that kind of system. But that's just kind of what you have to do. and You have to just kind of push through it. And if you can do it, you can be successful out there and you can make a really good living. Definitely. And as far as, like, facing the hitters out there, did you notice any difference or it's, it's pitching is pitching, it didn't really matter? Or was there something you actually had to – look for facing those Japanese hitters I'll tell you what there is one team out there they had a hitter and they paid him a million dollars they called him like the foul ball king and I would pitch against this guy and these at bats would go 15 pitches plus and I would be either be like I'm walking the dude or I'm gonna hit this guy <laughs> I'm sick of this shit <laughs> um, I had guys hit the ball off the ground off me um Shogun, who is with Cincinnati Reds now, the best hitter I've ever seen in my entire life. He will have a great career here in the United States. But there's just so much talent out there. I mean, they don't mess around. I mean, the, the practicing is – I couldn't do it. I could not get on their level of practicing the way that they prepare themselves and how long they stay at the field before and after. It's insane. But the schedule for baseball is a little bit easier on your body. Um, you know, you're not playing every Monday, or I think it was every Monday or Sunday. Every Monday was off. Oh, nice. Then you have off days in between. So it was just like, it was perfect. It was perfect. So you got a chance to play in the 2018 uh, Japanese League NPB, which is the Nippon Professional Baseball All Star Game. What was that experience like? Oh, man. It was, I didn't think I was, you know, that was the last thing on my mind is to be an All Star my first year out there because. You know, from what you hear from a lot of people, like I said, it's that first year, is, it's kind of hard to get used to everything. And I just went on a roll and uh, pitched well. But that all-star game, the fans, and all the stuff that, that, that goes around preparing it and the stuff that's going on during it, it's just baseball is so much different out there. I love it. I wish I could go back and play baseball out there because I thought baseball was played the right way. And it made it a lot more fun in a sense. So I appreciated that part about, you know, the baseball out there. It kind of brought back a sense of this is fun again, like that feeling I got with the Bay Bears uh, when we were in double A. That was something that I was kind of searching for because that past, the last year I was in the United States, it was, it was too much. It was, you know, the up and down, the, hey, wait 10 days, you're, you're, you're going to pitch. Oh, you know what? We don't need you to pitch. Just, you know, in five days, you're going to go back to your routine. It's just like you can't be successful doing that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that people don't see uh, behind the scenes. Um, so it's just – it's not like that. What I was told when I went to Japan was, hey, go out there, pitch every once a week. You're going to pitch, compete, do your thing. We're not going to bother you. So – that's awesome, man. I'm glad you got that experience. It sounds like it was a lot of fun. So that's great. You got to do that. And of course, now I get to pay off the tease, the fun part. Uh, so your last game was against the Astros for the, when you were with the Blue Jays still in 2017. So it comes out, of course, everyone knows they had the scandal and they were cheating and uh, videotaping and doing all their electronic BS that they were doing. And so, uh, I come across in February, I see this, I see Mike Bolsinger is, is suing the Astros. I go, Hey, I know that guy. <laughs> so I wanted to just, of course, there's a lawsuit, so you can't talk about everything, but what can you tell me about the process of doing that and kind of the feedback you've gotten since uh, it was told that you were doing that? Um, 
So that took me a lot to do that because I don't like to definitely be in the spotlight, spotlight with stuff like that. Um, and I knew it was going to blow up to be a huge thing, especially nowadays with the way news kind of travels and, and stuff happens. But it took me a while and I wanted all the facts and I got so lucky that these people on Twitter did all this work because it would be nothing. If none of that was out, like what kind of case would you really have? Because I'm a guy that likes, I like the facts in front of me. You know, at first you heard they were cheating in 2017. So I was like, okay, whatever. I pitched my last game against Astro. Doesn't mean they were cheating against me. Like, right. It, it could have, and you don't even, you didn't even know what level of cheating it was until you saw those. Yeah. Games. It could have been like, oh, what you're telling the second baseman. That's cool. Cause it happens every time. That's just baseball. You have to change up the way you're pitching. I mean, that's just all you have to do. And then someone came out with showing the amount, the games, and it was my game. And still at that point, I was like, well what can you do at that point yeah. yeah like i can't do anything they could have been cheating against someone else like i still needed like boom and then a guy came out with a video and he showed how many bangs while i was pitching i was like ding ding like that's all i needed and man it's sad and it's very disappointing and it angry to think about because you work so hard and you go through so much stuff to get to a point in your career that is almost impossible to get to. Um, and you're there and I accepted, you know, and let's back this up. I accepted when I had gotten beat that, you know what? Hey, I just got my ass kicked. Like that's just baseball. You're going to get your ass kicked. And I did. And, you know, I remember when that game ended, there is just something in my mind, you know, I'm getting sent down. You get that feeling as a baseball player, you know, what's going to happen. And I remember getting to the locker room and I neatly put my stuff together because I knew I was probably going to get sent down. So I wanted my stuff together quickly so I can put it away quickly. Cause I was, you know, I was a little embarrassed. Like I don't remember getting beat down like that before. I really don't. Where you felt like you, they knew every pitch that was coming. <laughs> yes. And that's the first thing I told them. Like, I remember I was like, man, they were, I was like, it's like they knew it was coming. That's what I told someone. It was like they knew it was coming. Like, they're that good. I was like, this team, there's no way they don't win the World Series. I was like, they are so good. And it made me think, like, how did I pitch so good against them the last time I pitched against them? Because a lot of people know I pitched against them in Toronto probably a few weeks before that. And that was when I was kind of transitioning to that bullpen role. So I'd been down to the minor leagues, pitching one or two innings, probably 20, 25 pitches a game. And I come up, have a few outings, and I have to come in early in the game to come in relief. And at that point, I think at one point I was five innings. I had two runs, giving up two runs, eight strikeouts, one walk. To me, that's, a, you know, that's pretty good against this team. Now that when I, after I looked at that game, I was like, well, I did that to them before. So, and I think I remember my coach asked me, he's like, Hey, how do you feel? And I was like, at that point, I just can't be like, I'm tired. You know, I was dog tired. I'm a reliever trying to do pitching, uh, you know, five, six innings. But as a player, I can't just be like, Hey, uh, I'm done. I like, like, I'm good for the day. You want to prove yourself, especially when you're a guy that, hasn't really proven themselves yet and you want to earn people's respect. So I went out there, ended up giving up two more runs. But in my eyes, you know, on paper, the outing might not look good. But if you were there and you saw the way that I pitched, you know, I remember my pitching coach coming to me and like, dude, don't hang your head low. Like you need to hang your head high. That was a great game you pitched against the best team in baseball. And I felt good about it. And then man, I I was embarrassed. Well, and for sure. Could you like, could you tell while you're out there, like, dude, they're not swinging that shit they should be swinging at. Like, why are they laying off these pitches? Could you tell in the, during the game that it was a little weird? Well, I mean, you're always going to like, sometimes be like, you know, how's it going? What went through my head was, man, how that guy lay off that pitch? Come on. Like, yeah, I had him before with it. He just didn't like magically get better from seeing me once in his whole career. Like this is the first time he saw me. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was just, I mean, look, I just thought they were the best team. I was like, this team, hands down, if I had 
If I was if I was a better, I'm betting on the Astros to win the World Series. But yeah, that I mean, I got sent down the next day, and or I got sent down that night, and I actually had my wife drive me to the field. I tried to get there before the team did because I just didn't want to see anyone. I was embarrassed. Like I didn't want anyone to see me because I was really truly embarrassed of what I did on the field. Right. And I packed up my own stuff and I literally walked out of the front door of the Astros ballpark and waited for my wife. A couple of guys came up to me and like, a couple of guys came up to me and noticed who I was. I'm like, Hey man, you'll get them next time. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, dude, take a hike, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get them next time. But, um, yeah, but I mean, I ended up getting sent down, but the first thing that went through my head was, Hey, let's have my pity party right now, but continue to pitch well and you'll get that chance. And to me, that was the greatest, one of the best uh, minor league seasons I'd had. I think I had like a one seven through 50 innings that year. And I was like, well, there's no reason why I can get back, but I ended up not getting called up. But like, you know, like you can tell everyone, you know, one game, Sometimes that's all you get in baseball. You get yeah. one chance. If you don't get it in sports in general, if you don't take advantage of that situation or pitch well or show some sort of promise, you're gone, especially if you're not a proven guy. You know, a lot of people don't realize baseball is a business. You know, these people sit up in the stands, eat their hot dogs, drink their beer, and like, hey, I'm watching a sport. That's cool. I'm going to go home. Well, you don't realize what went on before the game. You're not realizing what's going on during the game. And you don't realize what's going on after the game. Lives are changing. The business moves that need to be made that are costing other people's careers and people are getting sent down here. It's just crazy. You know, and I, I remember seeing an article that, uh, what was it, Gaddis? Um, I wish I had it. I don't have it. But yeah. and one of them, he said, you know, you're going to sit here and tell me that you can actually tell me what pitch is coming. Like, this is awesome. There's millions of dollars on the line. Well, guess what? Like, how do you think I felt? Like, I have my career on the line. And from what I was just shown, like, all you cared about was yourself, you making your money and not caring who you kind of stepped on. You know, you have to look at this like a business. If you came into some huge business, I got on someone's computer, hacked their information, took it, used it for myself and bettered myself. I'm I'm pretty sure that's against the law. (laughs) <laughs> definitely yeah. you're gonna go to jail you might get sued i don't know what's gonna happen but that's the way you have to look at it right and it's tough because i've gotten such good feedback from people but i get negative feedback from some people that's the chance yeah that's the, the chance you take by doing something like this but yeah I- and it sucks because i i don't i hate that because i don't like people that hate me like i just don't i like to be a life guy sure you're not doing that just you're not doing it as a troll you're not do- doing it yeah. for any other and then, hey, these guys cost me at least a, a portion of my career, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, from what I, you know, you, you altered a person's career. Like, I want to be the one to determine what happens to my career out there. I don't want something so significant like this to be the reason why I get sent down. And it happened. You know, you pitch like shit, you get sent down. That's just all there is to it. Yeah. As far as, so you said you got some good feedback. Um, you know, obviously everything's in kind of a holding pattern right now, but uh, hopefully there is a resolution here because obviously the players never got punished. You know, the GM got fired, the coach got fired, but the players are skating by. So what are your thoughts on that, that nothing has happened to the players? It's unfortunate. I mean, like I said, like Gaddis, I liked his, yeah. I liked his interview he had or what he said. I mean, he was pretty upfront about it, but, you know, he's retired now. So he's kind of not getting the whole like, but I appreciate what he said. And there's a few others, but a lot of them, you know, they don't care. You care because you got caught. If no one had ever said anything, who knows? This probably would have still kept going on. We don't know how even much longer it did go on for. Right. But yeah, you only care when you get caught. Like, right. you know, if, you, if someone, if they said that to me, man up told me that, I'd be like, oh, screw it. Like, at least you admitted it. Just like I can admit Hey, I got my ass kicked that day. I'll pack my shit up right now because I know I'm getting sent down. Like you can't pitch like that. I remember texting my dad, and my dad was like, "Well, have fun in triple. You're going back to AAA." Like he's pretty <laughs> straightforward with me. <laughs> I, had couple, uh, I mean, I had friends too, and be like, hey, "You know," before I even say anything, I get a text from a buddy. 
hey, just go back down to AAA and pitch well. Dude, how do you even know I'm going to get sent down? You just freaking know. Like, you can't pitch like that or have an outing like that and show no sort of positive to anything. Right. Especially if you're a fringe guy. Yeah, that, I know for sure. So after that experience, you, you did get to go to Japan. And then, so now where, where are you at in your career at this point, even though there's, you know, the shutdown and everything, where, where do you see your baseball career at right now? You know, I don't know. It's, I, I, I play catch still. I stay in shape just to kind of see what happens. I personally, I wouldn't mind going back to Japan. Um, because I have no idea what's happening out here with baseball. I've heard so many stories from players, buddies of mine, saying, like, this is what's going to happen. I'm like, this is outrageous. Like, I mean, there's going to be guys who are going to have to quit this year because they can't afford to sit around for another season and not play and get paid. So you're going to see tons of guys just be like, well, either I sit around, go bankrupt and waste all my money and wait for next year, hope something happens, or I'm just going to go get a job now. And you can't even do that right now because what's going on. So it's like you're put into this. It's such a shitty situation what's going on right now. But, you know, as for me, like everyone else, you kind of just in that limbo stage in between what's going to happen. I'm just waiting till you hear what's going to happen here and maybe over in Japan. Um, just anything. You know, I still feel like I can pitch. Um, I saw you working on a changeup recently on Twitter. How's that going? Oh, man, it's – that makes me so mad. I, after 10 years in pro ball, I finally get a change up that I like and it's doing what it needs to do. And I can't even freaking use it. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the worst? You finally figure it out and you can't throw it, throw it to anybody. I mean, I give that compliment to Strasburg. I watched him pitch in the world series and I thought it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And I would slow down and watch how he kind of threw his change up and I kind of manipulated the grip a little bit, but, I mean, that was the main reason why. So I was like, dude, you have to have a changeup. You just have to, to survive. And I think he just showed everyone why he's one of the best pitchers out there. So. Oh, definitely. Well, at least, hey, you'll have it now if you get the chance to go back to Japan and see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you what. Thank you very much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. It was great. A lot of great insight. And uh, if you want to follow Mike, he's at, at mbolsinger on Twitter. Uh, you can definitely follow him there. But uh, thanks again, buddy. And we'll definitely talk soon. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I had a good one. Thank you, man. Thank you. All right. Thank you.